everything to look like it's perfect. It was like a, excuse my language, but just a f***ed up fairy tale. Just weeks after their wedding, Ryan began posting videos of Jasmine on his MySpace page. Hey, baby. Look at this place. This is our life. But just a month into the marriage, private tensions burst into full view. In April, Jasmine and Ryan were attending a glitzy Las Vegas pool party. They were both drinking heavily. And then, Jasmine started talking to a man named David. I look over and I see Jasmine and she's, she's making out with David. And I was like, Jasmine, what are you doing, you know? And Ryan then sees. And um, he sort of just shoved her, like a real fast shove. And then, you know, she startled her and he shoved her again and pushed her in the pool. Jasmine filed a police report, and Ryan spent two days in jail. Worse, his violent behavior threatened what had become in just a few weeks a marriage of convenience. Turns out, both Ryan and Jasmine got more than love out of their arrangement. Ryan got to stay in the U.S. I was told that his visa was expiring, and he needed to marry somebody to stay in uh, the United States. And Jasmine got some cold, hard cash. Or at least, that's what Ryan had promised. He kept telling her he'd put money in her bank account. He was, you know, he was promising her like $10,000 a month, and he, he, he wasn't giving that. She was dipping into her own money for him. You always have an excuse why the credit card never went through. The money's up in Canada. Things aren't transferring correctly so I need to go borrow some money or, you know, pay for the groceries and I'll pay you back. Slowly, Jasmine began to suspect she'd been had. I think she always had the upper hand in her relationships. And the fact that Brian Jenkins, who in my opinion is um, probably the world's best con artist, for him to come and to take her by surprise, I think, even shocked Jasmine. When she realized she was never going to see that $10,000 a month, the ideal marriage turned nasty. Jasmine moved to an apartment in Los Angeles. Ryan followed her, and she let him. She knew that he was obsessed or lusted after her, and she liked it. Then Ryan brought home a lover and made sure Jasmine found out about it. He could never have Jasmine the way he wanted to have her. I think, you know, him sleeping with a girl, you know, he knew what he was doing, you know, and her walking in on it. Finally, Jasmine raised the stakes. She started talking about an annulment. Around this time, Ryan got back in touch with Megan Hauserman. I was really just in shock of his appearance because he looked like he had lost about 20 pounds. He was very pale. He just didn't even appear to be the same person that I had known a couple months earlier. Despite his appearance, Ryan had some good news. He'd been asked to be on another reality show. This show wasn't about getting love. It was completely about the cash. The winner would take home a quarter of a million dollars. He said he was doing the show for Jasmine. He wanted to win this money so that he could win her back. He said it was driving him crazy that he couldn't get her to like him. Ryan signed on for the series, I Love Money, season three. In June, he left Jasmine in LA and traveled to Mexico for a month of shooting. While he was away, Jasmine spent a lot of time with a former boyfriend, a successful Las Vegas businessman named Robert Hasman. Something else Ryan didn't know, Jasmine had filed to have the marriage annulled. Coming up, Jasmine Fiore's sudden disappearance and Ryan's frantic search. Hey, it's Ryan. Is Jazz with you? I 
can't get a hold of her. In June 2009, only three months after their quickie Las Vegas wedding, Ryan Jenkins and Jasmine Fiore's marriage was in serious meltdown. Ryan was in Mexico to start work on his new reality TV show. He and Jasmine weren't speaking. Financial and sexual treachery had made them bitter enemies. Both Ryan and Jasmine were like chameleons, always changing to suit the moment which makes it kind of difficult to have a relationship with any depth. In a marriage like that, a minor conflict could quickly turn love into hatred. But enemies or not, Ryan and Jasmine had one thing in common. They both believed in the power of personal reinvention. In their own ways, they were probably still hoping for a happy Hollywood ending. When Ryan returned to Los Angeles from Mexico in late July, he had some dramatic news. He came back telling her how much he loved her and that he had won this contest for her and that he was going to get $250,000 and he was going to give it to her. And, you know, I think he basically told her what she wanted to hear. Though I Love Money season three never aired, Ryan may have been for real this time. I have it from a really good inside source that Ryan Jenkins actually did win the competition and the quarter of a million dollars that went along with it. That much money may have done the trick. Despite her relationship with Robert Hasman and despite having filed for an annulment, Jasmine suddenly seemed willing to give Ryan another chance. She dyed her hair and became a brunette as if to signal the start of a new phase in her life. Then, on August 2nd, 2009, Ryan hit the small screen in a big way. Hello, Megan. The first episode of Megan Wants a Millionaire aired. You met any Canadians before? Never. Ryan was in fine form and looked like a winner. I mean, the reality is, if you are on a reality show, you are a star. And both Ryan and Jasmine seemed to be enjoying the limelight. Around the time of the premiere, they had dinner with sex toy Dave Levine and two of his friends. Ryan and Jasmine didn't just seem to be getting along, they were over the top. At least five times during dinner, all of a sudden they started making out. Like just, and just like, you know, just going at it. And my friends and I looked at each other like. For a little while, it seemed like old times. On August 9th, Ryan posted another video of Jasmine on MySpace. The voice you hear is Ryan. God, I love my life. And I love my wife. Ryan and Jasmine's reconciliation looked like it could be the genuine article. The promise of a quarter of a million dollars didn't hurt either. On Thursday the 13th, they checked into a romantic beachfront hotel in Del Mar, California. Then, two days later, things took a sudden, unexpected turn. Ryan sent text messages to several of Jasmine's friends, asking if they'd seen her. Hey, it's Ryan. Is Jazz with you? I can't get a hold of her. The messages suggested he was worried she might be playing games with him. I'm gonna be really upset if she just disappeared to prove a point or something lame. But none of Jasmine's friends had seen her. Around 9 p.m. on Saturday, Ryan filed a missing persons report with the Los Angeles Police Department. Suddenly, Jasmine was gone. And then, just as suddenly, she wasn't. There's a big suitcase. I took my middle finger and I just lift it up and sure enough, it looks like a body. It's for sure a body? Yeah, I mean, yeah. The suitcase had been found in a dumpster in the town of Buena Park, 30 miles south of LA. It was leaking what appeared to be blood. Inside, police discovered the crumpled body of a nude young woman. 
twisted in a fetal position. Parts of her were missing. The teeth were yanked out with some type of a plyo instrument. The fingers were cut off with some type of a double-edged type instrument, something that maybe you'd prune your roses with at home. The killer's apparent motive for the mutilation to prevent police from identifying the victim through fingerprints or dental records. Our initial thought process was this may be the work of a serial killer. Detective Leppi and I both looked at this and said, there's no way a loved one that did this to her. Examination revealed that the woman had been severely beaten and then strangled. But without fingerprints or teeth, it would be next to impossible to identify her. The coroner got a break when they discovered that the body had breast implants. And people don't realize that most breast implants have serial numbers on them. In this case, they were able to identify the body and get a jump on the investigation. On August 17th, the murdered woman was identified as Jasmine Fiore. When I found out, I was like, it, it can't be her. I, I mean, that was the only thing I can think of. It can't be her. Next, Aphrodite Jones gets the inside story from the detectives who worked the Jasmine Fiore case and gets a look at chilling footage from the night of the murder. You see him on the video surveillance running into his room, getting inside. Ryan Jenkins had been an up-and-coming reality TV star. His marriage to a hot young model seemed to be on the rebound, and he was about to have $250,000 in the bank. Now, his wife was dead. Detectives Gregory Pelton and Sergio Lepe were assigned to the Fiore murder investigation. Immediately, like any investigation, when a woman's murdered, we look for people close to her. So we wanted to speak with uh, Mr. Jenkins right away. So now, you went and knocked on Jenkins' door? Yes. And he wasn't there? No. Where was Ryan Jenkins? On Monday night, Buena Park detectives found out. Los Angeles police had talked to Ryan that morning about his wife's disappearance. They wanted to ask some follow-up questions to Mr. Jenkins, and when they asked him to come to the station, he says, I can't, I'm on my way to Canada because my visa's about to expire. Uh, that's when we took action and decided to pursue Mr. Jenkins. Detective Lepe immediately put out an APB on Ryan Jenkins' car and alerted U.S. and Canadian border patrols to watch for him as he attempted to cross. Of course, we find it suspicious that he has not made himself available to us. He was the last person seen with Ms. Fiore. At this point, he's merely a person of interest uh, simply because of the suspiciousness of his disappearance. We, we can't find him. Detectives worried that Canada wouldn't be Ryan's last stop, so they stepped up their pursuit. Because Ryan's family's wealthy and his father has uh, properties in Honduras and they own their own plane, my theory was he was trying to get to a non-extradition country. Orange County District Attorney Tony Rakakis tells Aphrodite Jones what happened next. Can you describe the kind of trouble you had trying to find Ryan Jenkins? How did the chain of events occur to actually close in on him? We put the word out in a very big way that we were looking for him and what his description was, who he was, and, and issued the warrant for his arrest. So all of uh, law enforcement was involved, and uh, including the, uh, the federal government. By August 20th, the Fiore murder case had become an international manhunt with some 40 investigators in pursuit of Ryan Jenkins. By now, police had found some damning evidence. We believe he's armed, he's, he's dangerous, he's desperate. If Ryan was caught, he'd stand trial for the murder of Jasmine Fiore. Three days later, authorities finally caught up with the fugitive. But Ryan Jenkins would not be heading to trial. In a motel room in Hope, British Columbia, Ryan was found hanging with his own belt tight around his neck. 
when I opened up the door, I just cracked it open to say hello. Then I opened up the door further, and there he was hanging. 